like to start by actually thanking you for setting this up and giving us the opportunity to talk about the Rivers Trust movement in Wales. Um, I've been waiting quite a long time to get to speak to the Meadows group, so this is a real nice opportunity and I'd like to thank you. Um, so here we go. So I'd like to talk to everyone today about the work of Ronith Cymru and the Rivers Trust in Wales. I'm Caroline Orr and I'm the Vonneth Cymru Senior Project Officer um, and you can find us online and on Twitter. <coughs> Before we start, I'd like to just pay a brief homage to our late great CEO, Dr. Stephen March Smith, who sadly passed away in August and he will be greatly missed, but there's a lot of work and projects that I'm going to speak about, which were started by him. So, okay, so a brief rundown of the Rivers Trust in Wales. There are six Rivers Trust in Wales. We cover all of Wales and the marches. Um, there's a map there. I think the one, we're very lucky to have Harriet with us tonight. She'll be speaking later. Um, and she's currently working for the West Wales Rivers Trust, which covers the area of Carmarthenshire Meadows, Pembrokeshire and Ceredigion. Um, Avonith Cymru's role is basically to facilitate works for Rivers Trusts, regional Rivers Trust to deliver on the ground. We have been accused of being a fisheries organisation. We are fisheries focused, but that also encompasses habitat restoration, freshwater, land use, and various other practices because they're all connected. We go from the uplands right the way out to sea. And we, we do use salmon and migratory fish as our um, iconic species. I always kick these things off with by asking why are rivers important? Um, almost 70% of the planet is covered by water. Less than 3% of that is fresh water. Um, the rest of it is saline and ocean based, even then less than 1% of that is accessible fresh water. Rivers not only support life as we know it, Jim, but are significant contributors to the worldwide water cycle. Um, on that note, as you can see on the left, we have a lot, a lot of water in Wales. Um, we're quite lucky. Uh, some areas get up to three metres of rainfall per year. And rivers are also important because of habitat connectivity and all other biodiversity gains that they supply. Very briefly, I could talk about that all night, but I'm not going to. Okay, uh, I have to touch on the threats and issues that rivers are facing, uh, especially the rivers in Wales, where we're concerned about. Um, they're extremely vulnerable. Uh, they suffer from climate change, bad land management practices, acidification, pollution, nutrient enrichment, eutrophication, uh, the dumping of waste. They're seen as a very good system for taking things away. Uh, sewage works, pesticides, invasive species, blockages. There is a lack of regulation that we have in Wales. Um, and abstraction, these are just naming a few and I will go into just a few of those going forward and actually what we're doing about it, I'm trying to keep this an extremely positive talk. On the right hand side, you will see very familiar sites in Carmarthenshire, i.e. Uh, not very informed spreading of slurry and that is an issue that I'll be touching on later and that's where Gareth comes in as well. Okay, it's quite a bleak picture at the moment. Um, we're facing massive biodiversity declines. Uh, there's been a recent report published um, by the WWF and freshwater species are declining at a rate 76%, which is much, much higher than marine and terrestrial species. Freshwater habitats are in worse condition than those of forests, grasslands or coastal systems. And life as we know it depends on it, Jim. <laughs> Okay, so what does this mean for our fish? These graphs are quite old. Um, I didn't have the chance to update these before this talk. And this is probably how long I've been waiting to speak at the Kamal and Shimedos group, to be honest with you. Um, so these, these are from 2000 to 2016, and these are rod catches. 
um, and migratory fish catches on the Tawi and the Tyvee. Um, it's quite clear that they're in decline. Rod catch, unfortunately, overall is seen as one of our most informative numbers. Uh, we do have electrofishing results, however, these are quite sporadic at the moment and um, not very comprehensive, so that's something that we're working on. But the whole point of this graph is that the issues and threats above genuinely mean a decline in fish, which is something that we don't want to see. What does that mean for whales? So why are we concerned with fish? In 2009, a guy called Guy Moore published a paper um, actually putting an economic value on the each salmonid or migratory fish caught in Wales for the rural economy. And it equated to over £2,000 per fish for the rural economy. Obviously, people were travelling here, they were staying here, rod licences, going out for lunch, going shopping. Um, Rod, license, uh, rod catches have actually decreased, obviously, with our uh, population decrease. So this amount since 2009 could be exponentially more than that. They could be worth a lot more than that to the rural economy. An interesting fact is that since lockdown, rod license purchases have actually increased in Wales. So local people are actually getting out and about and seeing and trying to catch these fish, which is a good thing. Another reason to preserve them with health and well-being knock-on effects, obviously. Um, so what are we doing about all of this decline? In 2017, um, Yvonne Cymru, myself and Dr. Stephen March-Smith began a fisheries habitat restoration project. We, uh, it was out for an official tender and we actually bid against um, consultants in Europe and we won. I'm quite proud of that fact. And what does that mean? It means that we, we get out and we survey these rivers. Um, we work very, very closely with Natural Resources Wales and it's a way of facilitating local rivers trusts um, to actually get out on the ground and walk the riverbanks looking for issues um, and opportunities. Um, these opportunities and things get put down into a comprehensive report um, and into a GIS mapping system. The reports have today gone to Welsh government um, and hopefully they'll all be published soon. They're very much working documents, live documents. Some catchments are being revisited so it's anticipated that the GIS will keep everything moving along and photographs will be updated and works will be updated in real life time. Um, so an interesting part of this is out of the surveys and the reports, all of the actions and opportunities that are found are prioritized and they've actually been costed up so far. So each action or opportunity that we find to remediate against any of the issues that we found on any of the water courses that we've come across uh, or been paid to survey, we have actually costed up the action and we've put that into a spreadsheet of doom, <laughs> which has also gone to Welsh Government and Natural Resources Wales and has led to this year one, um, £1,060,000 funding from Welsh Government to deliver prioritised actions as a result of these habitat surveys on the ground. Um, and regional rivers trust, and I must say West Wales Rivers Trust in particular, are working very, very hard on delivery and it's all very, very exciting. So I'm going to discuss that on a nationwide level and I'm hope, hopefully Harriet might talk about some of her individual projects and more going forward. Um, so fish passage, um, as part of the habitat restoration project, we're, we're enabling 38 fish passage projects, which is opening up over 430 kilometres of river for migratory fish. Um, but what does that mean? So a barrier to fish migration could be something as simple as this, which is would be considered a large woody debris blockage. It's obviously a historic tree that's come down and it's caught other twigs that have come down. This one was particularly bad. It was on the confluence of the mother bee. Um, and I feel okay with putting this one up because we surveyed this one. And this, this was actually rectified as part of our habitat surveys. These are people going in to remove it. And I would like to say that this picture was included because two and a half tons of plastic was actually removed from this particular log jam. And two years prior to this, electrofishing results above this showed no juvenile salmonid recruitment, i.e. no fish were getting above that to spawn. Um, that's now been removed as part of the habitat surveys. Other easements um, 
can be slightly more technical. There's this one on the Y. Um, it's a historic weir. Uh, the concrete has been removed and the stuff on the right has been retained, obviously for flood risk management and the habitat gravel retainment above that. Um, and as habitat restoration, we're also um, completing over 60 kilometers of habitat restoration projects, fencing, um, in-stream habitat, soft revetment, tree planting. Um, and there are 51 projects in all throughout Wales going on. Uh, this is quite an exciting number for me. And here are just some examples of habitat projects. Across the top here, you've got an example of significant erosion. Um, some soft revetment has gone in in the middle. The telegraph pole actually had to be moved, which held the project up slightly. And to the right at the top is two years after the work has been carried out. So you can see that the riparian habitat has actually repaired itself really, really nicely. So these works can have significant effects on river health and spawning habitat, actually. Um, and to the bottom here, we have riparian fencing and soft revetment again, and obviously the need for it on the left and the result of it on the right. We're also running the European Maritime Fisheries Fund, which is a really exciting nationwide project as well. This has been running for a, a few years now. We've had various delays, and I will say that this hasn't been the easiest fund to run with requests for information from the EU, but we are getting there and most things have been completed. And just a few examples again of work that we're doing. Um, this is a weir removal in the D area, I believe. This is another weir removal and strategic boulder moving in um, southeast Wales. And this has opened up approximately 10 kilometers of spawning habitat. Uh, there's also, this is really exciting. There's um, coppicing materials laid into riverbanks, eight large gravel traps, 25 tons of boulder stone and 60 tons of clean gravel also added to the lower Olwen. Um, and that's a really exciting project. So that's, that's a habitat restoration in a nutshell, really. Another threat that we have is forestry and acidification. Uh, this is quite a significant problem in Wales. As you can see from the map on the left, the darker the area, the more high the risk from acidification. Acidification is generally caused from air pollution, closed canopy forestry, and intensive forestry practices in the uplands um, and various other things. So Avon is Cymru are facilitating funding for quite a simple solution with various rivers trusts to put limestone sand into acidified rivers with some very good results. The reason I brought that up is because there is a way that people can get involved to help us monitoring um, improvements now following habitat um, improvements and restoration efforts. And that is through citizen science and the Riverfly Partnership. And there's a lot of stuff that can be told to us through simply going out and looking at river invertebrates. Um, the mayfly can tell you about acidity, stoneflies can tell you about chemical pollution, and the humble freshwater shrimp or amorous gamorous can uh, significantly tell you about agricultural pollution. Um, and there is training on offer and the, the results from Citizen Science and the Riverfly Partnership are actually quite invaluable, especially at the moment. Um, okay, leading me on quite nicely to what are the main issues facing us? And this is quite a nice graph from um, January 2013, but it's, it's highlighting what we why there are water framework directive failures. Um, we have this measure, um, good ecological status or um, moderate or failing, and this is a water framework directive. It's a monitoring standard, basically, and a reporting standard about the health of our watercourses. Um, and as you can see, agricultural pollution on this graph, which is the third bar in, is by far uh, the worst cause of diffuse pollution in Wales and why we are failing. Most of our rivers are failing in Wales. Um, 
this is quite a nice quote. Oh, let me go back. This was quite a nice quote from a guy called Robert Vaughan, who's the manager of sustainable land, farming and forest management. And he has said, across Wales, our land and our rivers are used as a means of waste and sewerage disposal, um, without meaning to get everybody quite depressed. But on the left, what that actually translates as environmentally, on the top left, you can see a lot of dead earthworms. What we're going through now is a mass genocide of earthworms. And, I, and I'm sure everybody on this Meadows group will understand what that actually means regarding soil health. Um, Gareth can maybe go into that slightly later. Um, it means that we have polluted waterways and ditches and uh, raw sewage actually running through them and all of the other toxins that they contain. This leads to sewage fungus. We have serious over poaching um, of riverbanks and lack of vegetation causing erosion and nutrient infants again. And then the bottom right picture uh, is the very next slide. And what it shows you is a field which has been ploughed and the red dot is actually a bus and the field is quite nicely draining into a stream. So there's lots of issues and land use practices which impact on our watercourses, which Avonneth Cymru are actually actively trying to change with help, obviously, we're not doing it on our own. Uh, on the subject of agricultural pollution now, the left hand side is a map of uh, agricultural pollution incidents to Wales. So this isn't diffuse pollution, this is actually recorded incidents in Wales. Um, this number might be slightly skewed because this is an NRW document and this will only portray really the incidents that they've responded to, not the incidents that have been reported or not responded on or haven't been considered a category one really, which is a major fish kill. So this is the map, obviously the darker the area, the more the incidents. And this is a map from 2020, 2010 to 2016. This one is a map from 2010 to 2018. And this is a map from 2010 to 2020. And I think what's quite clear here is the situation is not improving at all. Um, if anything, in southwest Wales, the situation getting worse, it's declining. Um, I was in a meeting this week actually with the chair of the Rivers Trust, which is the Avonith Cymru equivalent in England and much more successful, I might add. Um, and they said that their objective is not to make it worse slower, is actually to halt the decline. And I think that needs a very concerted, joined up effort. Um, and there's a whole suite of reasons why that isn't happening at the moment. Uh, I have to talk about this because it's been a very hot topic. This is intensive poultry units, another form of agricultural pollution. And this is a, this is a map that's been generated by CPRW in Powys. And it actually shows a planning issue here. Um, there's a serious planning issue when it comes to consenting things that could have a cumulative effect on catchments. There isn't a joined up approach here and they do have, I think, an environmental, if not a legal responsibility to consider that. But this shows the extent of the problem. Um, obviously, the pink, orange and red ones, uh, dots are sheds that have been consented and the blue items are sheds that are in planning at the moment. Free range poultry units um, are not necessarily the best case scenario for a water course um, because of their potential for runoff. However, I think that's a whole nother slideshow and it's not, it's not really something I want to get into now. You can, um, the Wynos Foundation have done a, a, a lot of research on this. And NLW actually have a statutory responsibility to protect and enhance our watercourses. And I think that this map quite clearly shows that there's a disjointed approach happening somewhere along the line. Okay, um, I've chosen the why as it's quite a good example of where 
we can apply pressure basically to change things. The Y was a good example because the Y and Us Foundation, the Rivers Trust that functions there is actually one of our strongest in Wales and they collect their own data and they do their own reporting. And that's a capacity I would really appreciate other Rivers Trusts having in their own areas. However, you know, that's something we can all work towards. Um, so the, the Y was a good one to choose for us because we have the data to back up whatever questions were thrown at us. And obviously we gained a lot of publicity. This is um, an abstract from The Guardian. This is an abstract from Wales News Service, River Y facing ecological disaster as water turns green. This is one by the Daily Mail, choked by your breakfast eggs. And this was quite a helpful one from the Y and Us Foundation itself. It's from the Sun, stupid, which was a sarcastic comment about some of the comments that were being made about algal blooms on the Y. These pictures are included because I would like to highlight that the algal blooms are not a Y-centric problem. They are, these photos are actually taken from the TOWIE. The middle three are from the Golden Grove in 2018, and the outside two were taken by myself at Abergwilly in 2020. This is a serious issue, um, and it's one that does need addressing. Um, that's all I can say. However, I, sh I was debating whether to put this slide into threats or whether to put this slide in with uh, where I've put it, but I've decided to put it here. However, I do think it's a very dangerous uh, portrayal of the situation of our rivers. This is from Water Watch Wales. And green is obviously good ecological status. Yellow is moderate. And red um, is obviously failing. On the left hand side, we have from uh, the depiction of 2015. And on the right hand side, we have the depiction of 2018. What this clearly shows is an an increase in ecological status. However, there has not been. What's actually happened is monitoring has decreased and anomalies in phosphates have, uh, have been found up to 78%. And so they've been taken out of their reporting. And therefore this shows an increase in ecological status to Wales's rivers. And this is quite a blocker for us actually when we're applying for funding going forward. It's also quite a dangerous thing when people are looking at this for, for real genuine information about what's happening on the ground. And for, if phosphate levels have increased by 78%, I would argue that that's something that should have pushed a panic button in my personal opinion. So what are we doing about it? Again, I keep coming back to what are we doing about it? Okay, in 2018, the late, great Dr. Stephen Marsh-Smith actually wrote a formal letter of complaint to the European Commission about the state of Welsh rivers and the effect of um, agri diffuse agricultural pollution. This has resulted in uh, Welsh government discussion on agricultural pollution measures. They were due to arrive in Wales in January 2019. However, there has been much stalling. Um, Wales is obviously very much a farming um, culture. And um, I think there was a, a knee jerk reaction to what was being proposed. So, um, Avon is Cymru now, along with the World Wildlife Fund, Wales Environment Link, and others are joining forces specifically to tackle this this issue. There are avenues that we are preparing to go down, I would say. However, that's something I would ask you to watch this space on. Thank you. Also on agricultural pollution, we are running a, a TOWI agricultural pollution project, which brings us nicely into Gareth's presentation. So that's the end from me. I hope everyone's still awake. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. Okay, I'll just quickly share if I can share the screen. Wrong one. This one. No, try and minimize that. Can you see that screen? Not no. yet. Right, sorry. Uh, why won't that share then? Have you pressed the green button at the bottom? Oh, that may help. Hang on. 
יש לך באף כאן, אמרת שיש פין, לאון. Okay, great. Um, my name is Gareth Waters. I've been working for Ronit Kami for the best part of three years. A bit back on myself, I'm a, I run, the, run a small farm at home, a small dairy farm mixed with some beef and sheep. Um, prior to working for Ronit Kami, I worked as a glass tea advisor for many years. Um, so obviously I have a keen interest in conservation and, and quite concerned about the water quality in Wales. Uh, my current job is working in the Tawi catchment. Um, we have um, been to, uh, provided money to provide grants, some small grants um, funding for farmers in the area. Uh, basically the brief background is the Valero incident 2017 um, funded out this current project. Uh, there are three of us working in the Tawi catchment. Our role is to work closely with landowners, offer advice and a written report and where appropriate some grant funding. It involves a series of farm visits through cold calling or using existing contacts. And within the visit then we try and highlight areas that are affecting water quality. What we can offer as we go down the, the presentation. Um, prior to this, this project, we were working in the Kerry catchment and the Clayday catchment um, of, um, with, which, 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 was, which, was, um, which was funded by Do Come and other partners. Uh, as we go down the slide, we can see that uh, basically phosphate can be lost from from agriculture in many ways. Uh, stock access to water courses, uh, inappropriately placed muck keeps, dirty yard drainage. As part of our role, when we go on to farm, we try and highlight these areas if, if there are any of these areas on the farm and we try and resolve them with, with, with the report. Um, other areas where phosphate can be lost is soil. Soil is extremely important to us. Um, as you can see here, soil erosion um, can increase sedimentation in, in, in waters. Uh, there's poaching from livestock, and again, more evidence of soil erosion. The effect of this is that if there's too much sediment within, within water courses, it can, it can cover vital spawning uh, and gravel habitats for salmons, the salmonoids. Uh, indeed, if they cover for more than four days, they, they will die. Um, well, as part of our report, we advise on some land management issues. Uh, we can give water logging advice, compaction through soil testing on organic matter advice, um, some under sowing, and something I think which is extremely important and valuable going forward is uh, a sign map. Um, this basically shows where the water runs to not just with the contours but actually the topography of of the slope so every farmer that um, that engages with us and uh, we do a report and get a copy of the holding uh, of their land that uh, with with the sign up on it uh, basically the red areas are where the water flows to, so it can help in management decisions of when to spread slurry or when not to spread slurry uh, where to put um, farm manure stacks or not to put them, and outwintering, and also with cropping advice. Um, some of the examples we, some of the kind of grant work we have funded, uh, you can see um, here a quite a badly poached yard, um, and then also when the drainage has been sorted out, the concrete is there. Um, here again, then a badly. Um, eroding track, adding sediment to a nearby watercourse. This was then um, track repair and track insulation with a small, with a small drain there. Again, and one of the biggest things that um, we're coming against is the lack of gutting on farms. As you can see here, this, this is just basically walking on, washing onto a dirty yard. And again, um, increasing the storage 
on farm of um, of clean water via the slurry store, which is not ideal at all. Um, we try to uh, give uh, give funding then to, to have a situation more like this, where clean water is directly into clean channels and, and the drain is, is sealed, so no dirty water can get access to the clean channels. Here again, it's an example of how we, 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 we can fund to keep stock out the water courses. Similar pictures to Caroline's uh, stock have been accessed to here to, to come down to have water. Um, this is fenced off and we also provide an alternative water for the stock. So it's basically a win-win for the farmer then. Again here, badly poached um, crossing ways over, over, over a stream or water course, whereas this is far better than the clean water is kept clean and the traffic and the stock walk on there. Uh, this file, this, this slide has not, hasn't come out very well, I'm afraid. But um, with the, this is through some of the some of the figures from the project we we, we did on the Kerry and the Clear Day. Uh, we basically offered fifty percent grant, and this meant that a total of over hundred over hundred thirty thousand pounds worth of work and river uh, sorry improvements were identified on sixty one holdings. This basically averaged two thousand pound a farm. And of those 61 offered, 20, 20 farms took up the grant. Uh, the main kind of grants that were taken up, if you can see, was advice on the slurry storage capacity, clean and dirty water separation, manure management, and stock access to water course. Um, stock access is quite a, quite, quite a big issue up in, up in those catchments. Um, and here's just a quick summary, more detail of what we actually did on, on the project. Some 65,000 of, of total grant was offered. Um, 46,000 pounds of this was actually taken up and involved in improvement work on the farms. Uh, 45,000 meter cubed of, because we, uh, just to explain that in more detail, because we um, funded the guttering and alternative and, and better dirty and water, dirty and clean water separation. It meant that nearly 50,000 metre cubed of less dirty water entered the catchment um, of the Kerry and the, and the, and the, and the, and the Clear Bay. Uh, 23,000 pounds worth of grant to 50% on fire improvement with basic, was basically spent on water quality improvements. Uh, as part of our reporting uh, and working with farmers, over 11,000 acres of farmland was 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 engaged within the project and basically had a had a sign map. So the sign maps covered over eleven thousand acres. Uh, we recommended over eight thousand meters of fencing. Uh, Two thousand meters of of this was actually erected uh, with the grant funding and reporting, and over two thousand meters of gutting was installed to keep the clean and dirty water separated. This basically led then to. Um, over 4,000, 4,500 kilos of phosphate being removed from the two water courses. So basically, with we worked out that with the dirty water that was going in before um, before the project, the 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 project uh, was successful in the fact that it removed 4.6 tons of phosphate directly from the water courses. In total, there was 217 recommendations suggested to farmers' businesses. Uh, 100, over 150 farmers are positively engaged with across the both catchments. And again, 61 farms um, were offered grants and advice to make improvements. Uh, out of these 61, 20 accepted the grant and made improvements. And we worked with eight partner organizations, which are pictured here, Do Cymru, Wells Water, Ronnie Cymru, FAW, NFU, NRW, and, and so forth. Uh, and also five drinking bays were, were, were are blocked. Um, as part of the, I think one of the success of, of, of the project is the fact that uh, we, are, we are from a farming background, we understand the difficulties farmers have. Um, we try to emphasize the importance of soil to the farmer. Um, as part of our visits, we do soil testing. And as part of that, we dig soil pits and try to explain to the farmer what levels of compaction they may have or may not have. Uh, where they can improve their their soils through aeration, 
and maybe cropping cropping rotations. So going forward, then due to the success we had with the carry and the clear day, we've moved out now move into the Toby catchment. Um, this has meant employing an additional officer because because the the work there is um, as Carolyn highlighted is is quite uh, is quite immense really. So unfortunately due to COVID we we haven't really kicked off yet, but um, we are still within still a fledgling project because it's the first year of the project and obviously COVID has has knocked us back by a few months. But um, yeah, as going forward, we're quite positive. We're, we're going to engage with a similar number of farmers and obviously hopefully make some improvements that we have done within the TOWIE. Um, yeah, I hope that's um, okay. Okay, thank you very much, Gareth. I think you have to stop sharing your screen now. Yep. I presume you click okay. on that button again. And I guess it will be Harriet next. My turn. Right. Let's see if this works. Hurrah. Yes, right. Hang on. <laughs> it's always in the way, this thing. Okay, so um, my name is Harriet. I've been working for the Rivers Trust for about um, six years, but um, lucky enough to come over to West Wales Rivers Trust at the start of this year, um, sort of just before everything kicked off with COVID. So an interesting time to start a new job, but luckily we've been doing some really exciting stuff. So it's been a, a good move. Um, so we, um, West Wales Rivers Trust uh, formed in 2017. Uh, we're an amalgamation of Pembrokeshire and Tyvee Rivers Trust that existed before us. Um, and our objectives are sort of on the screen. So basically to um, restore uh, damaged river ecosystems, uh, promote awareness of how important they are, um, and to also help promote enjoyment. Because obviously if there's less people out enjoying rivers and there's less people noticing the issues and caring if there are any issues. So our catchment goes from um, Aberystwyth in the north down to Neath. So it's quite a big catchment. There's only sort of three and a bit of us at the moment. So we're quite a small team, but we've got a lot of really good volunteers that help us get stuff done. So we're getting a, quite a lot of work done, which is good. Um, I'm not going to go through the issues because Caroline and Gareth did such a good job of doing that. So I'll skip those. Um, so the main thing we've sort of started off doing this year, um, thanks to Von of Cymru and Na uh, Natural Resources Wales, is doing surveys of um, most of the main rivers in our catchment. So this one is just an example, this is, this is the Rydal, um, but um, I've been on the Lucker um, today on the Amman, and um, so we I've been doing surveys looking for um, all types of issues, everything from uh, sort of the agricultural ones that have already been discussed to urban issues as well, and mainly sort of opportunities for improvement for all sorts of um, wider sort of river health uh, opportunities. Uh, so just to start off, I'm going to go through the, um, the work we've been doing over the last few months. Um, the, the first one we started off doing, uh, which is sort of usually the most complicated is addressing some of the barriers that were identified as part of our river habitat surveys. Um, barriers are sort of an issue, obviously, we all know they're an issue for, for fish passage, but they're also uh, an issue for general river, river uh, management. So the flows of the river uh, are impacted because they're impounded behind weirs. And also that interrupts the sediment processes the sediment movement downstream and also the level of oxygenation in the river so they're sort of a key one that that we like to address and um, using the funding that Caroline mentioned this year we've managed to address um, three we've got a lot more to go but it's a good start for this year at least um, unfortunately we can't get in the river and do any more of these um, from the 15th of October because that's the embargo period for, for salmon spawning so we're kind of limited on our time frames of this kind of work but um, We've managed to get three done anyway. So I'm just going to run through the, the examples of what we've done. Um, um, actually, this is a really important map to show. It just shows you the extent of the issues uh, with barriers in our catchment. So every single one of those dots is a barrier in Wales that we know about. And there's likely a lot more that we don't know about as well. Um, so you could probably, if you zoomed in on that map, you could probably 
trace the line of the river based on the barriers that are there because there's, there's so many of them. So they can be anything, some sort of um, weirs, fords, uh, dams, that kind of thing, plus the natural ones as well. But uh, those ones are all the artificial ones. So this is one that we did. This, this one isn't actually in Carmarthenshire, but it's, it's an example of what we do. So I think it's important to show because we will be trying to do more of these in Carmarthenshire too. So this one was on the Clare Bay. This is called Vickers Mill. Um, and this was uh, a weir that we've been trying to get rid of for six years. And I think if it didn't go this year, I think my boss would have, um, would have quit because it's been such a, a pain to get rid of. Um, but this is the best case scenario for barrier sort of um, work is to get rid of it entirely because it means that the river can flow as it's supposed to do, uh, which has a whole range of sort of benefits for wider river ecology, not just the fish, so the invertebrates, the, the aquatic birds and everything else. Um, so we've, we've got rid of this structure. After six years of um, trying to get consent for it, it took three days to remove. So it was a, it was a nice easy one to get rid of luckily. Um, and we're gonna monitor the, the sort of progress of how the river changes as a result of that. Um, sort of, yeah, fish populations, invertebrate populations, that kind of thing. So uh, the next, the second best option for sort of barrier con um, work is to do a, what's called a close to nature easement. So this one was in Kababasha, this was on the Sanin um, near Glandilo. Um, and this was a, uh, it's kind of behind the tree, you can't see it, but it's a culvert through uh, underneath a road bridge with a perch sill weir underneath um, and this was sort of about just over a meter high so quite a bit of a barrier for for fish to navigate plus having the culverts upstream of it too uh, so the way we got around this was to create a series of rock ramps which are basically um, effectively smaller weirs made out of rock, which makes it uh, big pools, which makes it less of a jump for the fish. So a series of small jumps rather than, than one big one. It does look quite stark in the, the, the after photo because that was taken just after it was put in. But once the vegetation sort of grows back, it will look a bit, a bit more natural. Um, but it just sort of reduces the impoundment and, and the height of the, the drop for fish passage. Um, then the next sort of, option for addressing fish passage. This just doesn't address the, uh, the actual barrier, but um, it's sometimes with sites, the access is really poor um, and we can't get in to take it out. Or there's different constraints along the weir, such as like uh, buildings right next to it, which mean that if we got rid of a structure, it might cause erosion and we might lose properties and all sorts in the river. So where we definitely can't do anything, or at least for the foreseeable future, um, an option is to put in a fish pass like this one. Um, and it's basically a ladder, which means that fish can, can sort of climb up rather than have to do one big jump. Um, and we put this one in on a tributary of the Tyvee this, this autumn as well. So we'll be monitoring this one to see how successful it is. So it was a quite a low cost option. It was a, a flat pack um, that our contractor put together and managed to get into a, a difficult to access site. So um, yeah, an another option for sort of addressing fish pass with a, with a small budget. The, uh, the next thing that we are looking at, at doing in quite a lot of locations is um, what, habitat restoration. So this ranges from anything from putting wood back into rivers where, um, where it's been stripped and sort of um, like straightened and made, um, ruined of habitat. Um, but the most exciting one is where rivers have been straightened. So there's a stat that came out a few years ago that said that um, over 90% of our rivers have been straightened over widened or modified in, in sort of some way and a lot of our rivers have been have been straightened and what that means is that we lose the meanders so we lose the flow diversity and we lose the slacker areas of water and the pinch points and they're all really important for different invertebrate species and different different fish species and different sort of life stages as well um, and you essentially lose sort of meters of habitat because it's been put into a straighter, uh, shorter channel. It's also really bad for, for flooding as well because you send the water uh, downstream quicker to the lowland areas which are more liable to flooding. So we like to, where we can, uh, put back in the, the old course of the river. Um, the photo example on the right isn't actually one of ours but it's quite a nice clear sort of idea of 
what can happen. Um, we're working with a landowner on a tributary of the Tybee up near Cross Karen to, to do a project like this. Uh, it takes a lot of planning, so hopefully we'll get it done next year, but um, so it was a really nice project to, to reinstate habitat. And there's plenty of opportunities like this to do in Carmarthenshire, but we're sort of starting off um, and sort of showing what we can do and then hopefully use that as an example site to, to bring other landowners to, to promote that kind of restoration. Uh, one of the key uh, bits of work we've been doing with our funding this year is riparian fencing. So we've got in total about 15 kilometres of riparian fencing that we're doing this winter, as long as we don't have a, a really wet one. Uh, we've done about between three and four kilometres so far. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to, well, stop livestock access. Um, it's been a, a study has been done a few years ago that calculated that cows are something like six times more likely to defecate in water than on land. So it kind of shows the importance of stopping those kind of nutrients getting in, um, but also sediment, excess sediment from bank erosion. And obviously that bank side habitat is really important for things like crayfish and um, water vole as well. Um, and also it's really important to the landowner to not, to not lose too much land. And uh, finally, it's a really important sort of wildlife corridor. Rivers are ri really important for all sorts of mammals to help move. So we've been fencing them off, 100% uh, grant funded this year. So it's been quite well received from the landowners. Um, and where we've completely excluded uh, livestock from the river, which is what we aim to do, we've been putting in uh, solar powered water pumps. So where there's no um, main supply of water, these are a really good way of uh, getting water out of the river into these troughs just by the power of um, solar. We also have one called a pupper pump, which is livestock powered. So a cow essentially pumps the water themselves to get it out. And it just means they don't have to go near the water course, which is, which is a winner for us. And it also is good for the, um, the farm as well because they're less likely to get injuries to their livestock um, and yeah, all sorts of like horrible um, like liver fluke and diseases like that. Um, so another one we've been uh, sort of aspect of the work we are doing at the moment is looking at natural flood management or NFM as it's commonly known. Um, and this is essentially working to reduce peak flows of water uh, down to flood risk areas. So things like putting in leaky barriers into ditches to uh, hold back water for longer, uh, to planting woodland across slopes so it can help absorb more water into the soil, uh, and also to reconnect rivers with their floodplains. So nowadays we kind of think that if, if land floods, agricultural land especially, it's a really bad thing, but actually obviously it's supposed to flood and it's supposed to hold back water in those locations. So we uh, I've got a big project on the Upper Tyvee at the moment. We're working with NLW to, uh, and a big landowner, something like 1,400 acres to develop an NFM strategy up there. So we've got some drone surveys taking place in the next month or two um, and some, some sort of GIS mapping assessments and we're planting hopefully thousands of trees up there, doing some ditch blocking and creating some uh, reconnected areas of river floodplain and some ponds and that kind of thing and some peat restoration as well so yeah that kind of this kind of work is becoming increasingly important obviously with the increased uh flood events that come with, with climate change so it's an example of, of the the leaky dams kind of thing that we do um and what's known as a scrape sort of a almost like pond like feature where we we create them to, to store water and this is the kind of thing i'm hoping that at some point there will be financial incentives for landowners to store the water because obviously it comes at a cost to a farmer to have a, a wet field so it's a, it's a financial gain for the communities that flood so hopefully something that might be rewarded in the future but we'll see uh, so with uh, monitoring it's obviously Declines in um, in NRW uh, staffing levels have seen cuts into WFD assessments. Um, we are really keen to sort of 
try and help fill the gaps, especially monitoring where we have done works to show whether they're successful or equally if they're not successful, it's, it's equally as important. Uh, so the way we're doing this at the moment, we've got, we are in the process of um, purchasing some electrofishing kits. So we've been using that uh, this autumn as a trial to, to monitor the um, benefits of our fish passage work and our weir removal. Um, we've also uh, got some video uh, cameras so we can try and capture any footage of um, migratory fish going up our fish passage, fish, fish passes, sorry. Um, and then obviously we've got the um, our monitoring, pH monitoring of our liming project, looking at the acidity of forestry as well. So a range of different things, but monitoring is definitely something that we are hoping to increase capacity on into the future. So uh, where do we want to be sort of in the future? Um, we really keen to further develop our schools and community engagement work. So we, as quite a small um, aspect of what we do at the moment, we'd like to go in and really work with young people to show them how not just how important our rivers are, but also how uh, amazing they are as, like a, as a resource to enjoy. So hopefully we'll get them interested from a young age. Um, and our community engagement work, we've got a really great project that's currently on hold because of COVID called um, Adopt a Tributary, where local people adopt their um, section of river and do anything from letting us know when there's a pollution incident to going in actively removing uh, pollution, sort of like litter and that kind of thing, or, um, or monitoring as well, river flow monitoring, like Caroline mentioned. Um, and we, yeah, we've, we've done a lot of work to address uh, the fish, fish passage that we have identified already, the issues, but we're hoping to try and um, get all of those ticked off eventually so that all um, areas of our, our rivers are accessible. Um, we would really like to uh, develop schemes that allow rivers more space to move because um, we think that the floodplains are, and that kind of wetland habitat are really important for, for fish at a variety of life stages. And then finally, we want to work with AC to help them to raise water quality issues up the agenda and government to help uh, bring more funding and sort of more regulations on those kind of things. Uh, so I've nearly finished, sorry. Um, what can you do to, to help? Um, the main thing I think from this is, is to be our eyes and ears on the ground. Um, obviously as a small sort of team between us, the Other Rivers Trust and AC, we, we can't be everywhere all the time. Uh, so it's really important that if anyone sees anything that look, looks or smells suspicious, any activity that shouldn't be taking place in rivers that they uh, report it to NRW. I know a lot of people do do that and have some concerns that they don't always go out, but um, if if uh, they have a few reports on uh, on one issue, they will eventually go out. Uh, so the numbers, the one on that logo there. Um, so it's really important to do that. Um, and there's a few sort of uh, campaigns going out at the moment, especially regarding um, sewage waste get, getting into water courses which are, are worth sort of signing or writing to your MP about just to raise that up the agenda because um well we've got some exciting news I don't want to take Caroline's eye on that but we've um, we're releasing the uh um an interesting map in the next couple of weeks showing the um the combined sewer overflow to our sewage outfall data um so you can go zoom into your nearest river and see how many hours the nearest um, outfall has been releasing raw sewage into your river for um, and I've seen the draft of it and it's quite eye-opening my, my nearest one in Clandilo has been releasing for 160 days of the year which is not definitely not storm conditions as they're supposed to do so that's worth keeping an eye out for and um, contacting your local MP if you're concerned about that uh, that's everything from me this is our uh, social media if you're interested in uh, following what we do and I try and update it as much as we can but yeah. Not so much. Okay thank you very much Harriet that was great yes. and uh, thanks to Gareth and Caroline as well. Um, some Maybe it would be useful if you emailed me um, the web websites and phone numbers and things that you've been mentioning and then I can distribute them to all the people who've 
um, are in the group. Um, that would be useful. Yeah, um, so we can, we've can we got time for questions. So if you, you can all unmute yourselves if you would like. Um, oh yes, I should have also said at the beginning, you, were, uh, you, you can leave at any point you want. You don't have to stay to the bitter end if you've got other things to do. But um, yes, you should be able to unmute yourselves if you just click on the little picture of a microphone in the bottom left of your screen. Um, oh, here we are. We've we've already got a. Um, question coming up in the chat. Uh, from Moira, do you have any issues with pipe bridges getting the councils to adapt? these historic designs. So I don't know if anyone's of you got anything to say with that. I'm not quite Caroline, sure. Caroline has, but she can't unmute herself. <laughs> oh, right. OK. <laughs> uh, how, I wonder how I do. Why you unmute her? Yeah, the one we did, the uh, Close to Nature sort of rock ramp one was a council owned structure. Can you find how to unmute her? Yeah, Caroline can't un, un... I can click on ask to unmute. Does that work? No. Hey. <laughs> Hi. Hi, yeah. yeah that has worked. <laughs> Sorry, I muted myself while other people were speaking. I'm on a cheat on a squeaky chair. Um, I was going to say Harriet's probably the best person to speak to about councils and bridges because she's been a fiend in delivery this year. So, if if you have any issues with councils and pipe bridges, Harriet. Um. <laughs> not issues um we well i mean that there's a lot of them around that are that are council owned because they're not on our main rivers um the one that we did the, the rock ramp fish pass was a was a council owned structure um i don't think there's any funding internally within councils to to improve fish passage but that would be something that i think is worth pushing up their agenda um we had to go through the obviously we get the ordinary water cause consent to to do work on any any non-main water body so we had to work with the council to to get that through and they were helpful in doing that um but there's there's a lot of them out there that are that are culverted that sort of need some sort of work doing even if it's something simple like putting in what's known as baffles which are basically wooden slats to um to increase the water depth within uh culverts because usually they're quite shallow and fish struggle to get to get through the shallow water i'm not sure if that answered it Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, you should be able to unmute yourselves according to my button at the bottom of my screen. Um, allow participants to unmute themselves. That's ticked. So I think, I think Caroline should do the beaver question. I was just about to ask if I could. So, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you, Harriet. <laughs> So I, I, I was actually waiting for beavers to rear their ugly head, and that's, that's part of my motivation for including the large woody debris dam and the two and a half tons of plastic. Um, we are we are concerned. Obviously, there are correlations between beavers and salmonid populations historically. However, I can fear, I can hear again my legendary ex CEO telling me that dinosaurs also used to be in Wales. So we don't need to reintroduce them as well. However, I do think there are serious habitat gains to be had and they are habitat engineers and obviously holding the water back is something that we're aiming to do. Um, and if you hold water back, it naturally repairs itself pH wise, it, it takes away sediment and it is something. However, it's not a strategic approach, approach at the moment. We need to choose the right beaver in the right place for want of a better phrase. And I would argue that we would like them in the uplands and the habitat is just not up there to support them, i.e. the trees, then, you know, we need, we could spend 10 years creating habitat in order to put beavers in the ideal places. And that is my position on that. Thank you. <laughs> Harriet, I don't know if you've got anything to add. 
No, I agree. I mean, I think that they're really important. I think, to be honest, I think we could we could talk like all about it all we like, but I think that they've been some sneaky additions of beavers anyway. So, um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I think we need, yeah, we need to look at improving the habitat before we really make a conscious effort to reintroduce them. But I think, yeah, I agree. Um, there's a question here from Maggie. Uh, a month ago, I reported an incident to NRW, which was that the farmer was digging the Cothy river, riverbed. I didn't receive a call back from M NRW, and the farmer has completed the digging, which I assume is clear access to the river for his livestock. The feature is ready to use, and my question is, what do you suggest is the best thing to do now? If, if I can take that question, it, it might even be a, a similar situation to one that I discovered on a lovely Sunday afternoon walk on the coffee. Um, and I believe the lady I was walking with might be listening in. Um, uh, it, it was quite a serious um, abstraction. Um, I, my, as Harriet already stipulated, all you can do really is call NRW. Um, if you see it, say it. Um, photographic evidence is always important, ideally with your phone so it's geotagged and people know exactly where it is and what time you've taken it. Um, uh, I, I asked, I asked, I, I reported um, a gravel abstraction incident on the coffee very recently um, and it was quite a large one and I must say NRW have been most receptive and have responded accordingly. So that would be my advice. I don't think anybody else can take any action on this. It's either licensed or it isn't, and NRW would be the people to answer that question. Um, I've got a question, actually. Um, Harriet showed a um, um, little graph of pH measurement. Now, Caroline, I remember in one of your talks I've been to some time back, in connection with the conifer plantations in the Upland, you were saying how you'd been um, finding amazingly low, very acidic, low pH readings in uh, various rivers. Yeah, Do you I want mean, to say uh, any more about that? Uh, in the, uh, that that is why I touched on the acidification issue because at one point prior to our um, some liming strategies that we're doing within forestry, we were liming within watercourses. And I don't think we were adding enough lime and I don't think we had enough information at the time. It was all seen very much as a pioneering project, which is how I think we managed to get funding for it in the first place. Um, and it was quite controversial because forestry refused to, set, to accept that there was an issue. Um, the, the lowest pH reading I had was actually within the Tawi forestry at the top of the Biscotta, which is a very high first order stream um, of the Tawi catchment. And it was a pH reading of 2.7, um, which is- That is incredible. Which is a thing I've I've heard of lower in the in the upper Y catchment, yeah. Which is which is the, funnily enough the same forestry, but the other side. Um, so I, I mean, argue, arguably, it's a it's a massive massive problem. But the tower you see is quite a unique issue as well when it comes to acidification because you have historic lead mines just below it, and pH low pH and acidity and lead um, and aluminium don't don't really mix for fish. It's, it causes uh, we call we call acidity the silent killer for salmonids because it it actually makes the aluminium a lot more active in the watercourse um, and it sticks to their gills. Now they can swim out to sea, but they can't actually change to salt water breathing animals. So they suffocate while they're while they're going through osmosis process. But that that happens in acidified waters. Um, and that's that's something that we really need to to be aware of in Wales, definitely. And it's something that I think is quite an underrated issue. Do you know if the liming that you've done up up in the forestry at the near the source of the rivers has, has that been effective? Absolutely, it, it has helped. We've extended. Obviously, it's all trial and error. We've. Uh, this is now a west where I'm. I no longer work on this project. I hasten to add, it is something that I did work on for a long time. So I don't want to tread on anyone's toes. Or, if, um, if Harriet, if you've got anything to add, that that's great. But it, it's just, um, yeah. I'm sorry. What was the question again, Andrew? 
<laughs> How well has it worked? Oh, it's work it is working. Obviously, it's trial and error. We realized we weren't putting enough in. We changed strategy. We started building leaky dams and applying powdered lime in gullies within forestry, the herringbone ditches that they build. And I, I presume I, I've since then I've I've not been involved with the project. So I presume that the results are looking good. Harriet would probably better place to tell you about the positive results of that but it as far as I was concerned it was definitely working it was quite a significant result yeah it's, it's definitely working it's uh, we're also looking at strategies for trying to, to do like a long-term solution so working with NLW forestry teams to try and uh, create sort of buffer zones a lot like deciduous trees along watercourses as well so there's quite a lot of movement in NLW to do that at the moment which is which is really exciting so hopefully you won't need to lie forever. Good. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see though, we'll see. Early days. Another question in the chat from Diana Wormald, who I always used to well, know. I'm you... masquerading here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. as, as is always the word. Oh, I saw Yannick Yannick also, question as well. Also, yeah. known as Diana has a question here. <laughs> what are the best water conditions and day or night time to spot spawning salmonids in an upland stream which regularly has young trout or salmon well like i don't that. know i don't know whether they're trout or no salmon. Um, that's the problem but i i tried last year starting from november going down and looking and i could never see any and looking online there don't seem to be many filmed examples of um, spawning. No. So, I know you've had interesting jawless fish in there. You've had well, we have had brook lampreys, yeah. So, um, <laughs> but I, I, it just just be nice to see if you know there was anything big in there and spawning. I don't I don't know how likely it is that there would be it would be salmon or sea trout. Um, there, there, there's uh, there is a way to tell if you're looking at. Um, juveniles in a stream if you see one juvenile fish with quite large fins darting about on its own and looking quite aggressive towards the others that would generally be a salmon and the okay. ones that are hanging around together would generally be a trout although that's not a very scientific way of of gauging it but that that would be how I would I would gauge it looking over a bridge okay um, when it comes to actually seeing a spawning salmon, I mean, these are these are officially at-risk populations. I think you're lucky if you see one, and um, fishermen would argue that you're lucky if you catch one, which is why they call it fishing and not catching. Yeah. Um, there is a technique called red counting where you can walk along a river at a certain time of year and actually look for um, turned over stones, which is a salmon spawning yeah. Area, basically, that would be like a nest for the eggs. And they will historically be in the same sort of place on the same sort of river every year. Um, one of my volunteers, when I first started, Peter John, used to take me out on a on a tributary down near Swansea, and there would be a red almost the same place every year that we went back. But actually seeing the salmon spawning there. I, I wouldn't know how to advise you to catch it. It would have to be a video camera on the on the river. I think I don't know. Maybe Harriet could advise on the technicalities. The, um, the, the the far the farmer who is used to own the property um, tells us that he used to go down in October with a torch and not a gaff but a hook, and uh, you know there were there were vast numbers of fish there. He, every year he would hook out one or two. Mm. And uh, clearly the numbers have declined dramatically because, or I'm not looking at the right time. And then... No, the, the numbers have declined dramatically. And I think I think the right time is by sheer luck, unfortunately, at the moment. We are hoping to turn that around as a Rivers Trust movement, though. There is hope. It's not over yet. Yeah. We've got another suggestion rather than a question here. In New Zealand, they spray paint a picture of spawning fish on their manhole covers to make the public aware that pollution is harmful to spawning fish, a cheap fix. We do that as well. It's um, it's called the Yellowfish Project in this country. Oh, right. 
it's a really good project we haven't done it for a while because well covid and stuff um but we yeah we don't do a spawning fish we do like a, a yellow fish tensile which the the kids put out of cereal boxes and we spray it with um a chalk based spray paint onto the next to the, the manhole covers and the drains the storm drains um just to sort of i know we put posters up nearby and it helps to raise awareness that the storm drains at the side of the road link directly into the nearest water course because most people don't know that and they will like wash their car on the side of the road or I've seen all sorts of stuff poured down in like concrete milk is the worst one um yeah. but it just kind of raises awareness and so few people actually know that those are so directly linked to the health of the river so it's such a cool project to do with kids and they love it because it's spray painting as well so can't go wrong with that one <laughs> Another comment here, Caroline mentioned riverflies.org as a good way to monitor health of benthos. Not sure what that means, but test site coverage seems to be patchy, very little on the tally. Is this reliant on anglers to provide the citizens for the citizen science? Riverfly is not dependent on anglers at all. It is, however, slightly funding dependent um, yeah. because the, you do have to undergo a certain form of training. I don't want that to put anybody off. It's just a general ID and you go down into six or eight categories of invertebrates. You, there's no species level needed and it's quite simple to see them when they're swimming in the water. Um, citizen science is very much about any citizen who wants to get involved can get involved. Um, uh, and I think I think the Riverfly census throughout Wales has sadly fallen by the wayside recently. Everybody's been quite focused on delivering projects, and it is an area that we'd like to kick up again. Hence, why I mentioned it. I am. Um, I also um, have. We have funding for um, three Riverfly training sessions that we were supposed to do. The, just before COVID. So I am hoping to reorganise them for, um, well, whenever we can sort of, I don't know, April, if we can get back out to do volunteer activities. So if you want to get in touch uh, for our website and let us know, I can add you to the waiting list for that one. But we've got, yeah, we're hoping to train another 30 people. So plenty of spaces. Sorry. Um, another comment, no, another question here. Where are we with iron oxide pollution from mine water in, in or water from mines in the South Wales Valleys? Anybody? Harriet, any <laughs> idea? <laughs> I have to I have to take this one on the chin and say I am I'm not aware of this, and this is something that I should look up, obviously, and uh, we, we've been quite focused on a lot of other things, and this isn't something that's come onto my radar, unfortunately. I don't know if, if Harry or Gareth even can add anything. I know there's a lot of work going on in um, the mines um, up on the Rydal and the Uswith up in uh, Ceredigion. Um, NLW have got a big project there looking at settlement ponds and options like that to try and help filter some of the runoff. But I don't know, I haven't heard anything for South Wales, but it might um, be happening. If, if I can add something there, yeah. um, we've, uh, I've been involved with the Palena project years ago, you know, in uh, Glencorug, which was basically um, putting big lagoons in and um, planting reed and such like and other species um, to uh, try and trap the iron oxide, the fer you know, the ferric oxide. Um, and it's been very successful, I think. It's been going about 20 at least years, I would have thought. And th there's another um, lagoon like that at um, Sangane by the uh, Morlice Colliery, you know, with that um, train crash where the uh, oh, uh, yeah. diesel yes. spillage was right next to that. If you saw the air photos of that, you saw those very orange lagoons. Well, that's the... Um, the More Lice project there, which has been going 10, 15 years as well. So there's obviously stuff going on, but I'm not uh, au fait with it at all, I'm afraid. Can I come in on this? Thank you, Richard. Can I come in on this? Yes, please do. My name's Kim Tribe. I run Fly Fish in Wales. I may know one or two people on this, but, but not so. Um, I was involved um, in the mine waters pollution at Abergawad back about 25 years ago, and the construction of a treatment plant with a line uh, lime funding um, established from 
um, getting information from the Sk Skips, Skips project in Pennsylvania. Um, I lobbied Peter Hain, our local MP and, you know, Minister, uh, further Minister for Wales at, at a later stage. And he secured one and a half million to treat, to, to construct a plant. But it was not general, um, and then the reed bed system. So it's a, it's a liming system for that. But we, we still have issues of these abandoned mines, no legislation in place um, by the Conservative Thatcher government at the time to clean up these issues. But there are leech leaching out situations that have happened all over South Wales after the abandoned mine waters. The big political thing with Peter Hayne was because the local canal in Neath was running orange um, and there were orange swans. So it was a very political issue. And that's how he ended up securing funding. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Harriet, you sent a link to uh, videos about the Towie. Yeah, um, yeah. If, if you so email that to me, I can email it out to all the Meadows group people. Yeah, they're, they're worth a watch. It's brilliant. Uh, the videos that uh, were funded from uh, by Isabel Kwamsha Council, they're, they're um, some stories from some of the old boys of fishing the Tawi sort of 40 years ago. Um, a lot of them are about their, their old poaching stories, which um, obviously hopefully doesn't happen anymore, but it's really nice to hear sort of them, the sort of fish that they used to have um, and what they used to get up to. Uh, some quite in, like funny stories in there from hiding from bailiffs. So I'll send that to you so you can share right, it around. Okay, I'll what. distribute those to everyone else. Um, time is pressing, but we've got two questions from David here. Um, Caroline showed slides of pollution in incidents showing a persistent horseshoe-shaped red area of the worst pollution in land northwest of Marvin. Is there any obvious explanation as to what is going wrong there and why has it continued over many years? Uh, secondly, do you do any work on invasive plant species and if so, with what success? Two very loaded questions there. Let me, <laughs> let me begin with the agricultural pollution maps. Um, you're right, the worst affected area is uh, where you said. The explanation is that these are considered to be the most persistent and um, most heinous agricultural pollution incidents that we're experiencing over a period of time. Um, the reason that they're, it's still going on is, oh, that's the million dollar question, is something that we've been working towards and, and building advocacy strategies towards for, for years now. It's because, in my personal opinion, it's because we have no regulations. Uh, I mean, our industrially polluted rivers in the southwest are now supporting populations of salmon that are increasing and our rural unspoiled rivers in West Wales are being polluted on an industrial scale and, and really monitoring um, by government bodies has, has stopped and where it has been shown to be an anomaly, i.e. 78% higher in phosphates within two years or three years, they take the phosphates out of the equation and therefore still show improvements. So there's, there's an element of regulation. There's an element of admitting what the problem is. There is um, a, a vast need for investment in infrastructure within farming. Um, we can't ask people to house their slurry stores at up to a £200,000 cost when the last time they could apply for a grant to do such farm works was 1985. Um, you, can't, you can't slip people with regulations and not give them the opportunity to change. So it's, it's a, it's a multi-level faceted problem and one which in our small capacity we're trying to change and we're working very closely now with other organizations who do have a lot of clout in order to bring this matter forward and hopefully that map by 2022 will show lighter um, colors and i'll be proud to show the water watch whales and our rivers improving but at the moment that's not the case um, secondly do we do any work on invasive plant species at avonith cumry no it's, it's simply a case at the moment of 
us documenting those within our river surveys and keeping an up-to-date record with biological records, which I would recommend anybody else that encounters invasive non-native species do keep an up-to-date record with their local biological record centre. Because anybody that's planning a project going forward needs to know exactly where these are. I mean, they're everywhere. But I mean, the more people that report where the issues are, the more prolific the problem becomes. Um, the delivery of INS work would very much fall within local rivers trusts and I know that the Wine Us Foundation are particularly active, I know that there's fishermen's federations that are particularly active, I'm not entirely sure if West Wales are running any INS projects at the moment. Um, no, we, we're surveying um, as part of our, of our river habitat surveys, um, but apart from the adopted Hooperty project, we haven't got anything strategic going on. Um, there are a couple of great projects in our area, like the um, Pembrokeshire Stitch in Time project, which has mapped out um, all of their balsam in, in a whole uh, river catchment, and they are I de they are actually managing it from the top of the catchment down, which is having a, a proven impact every year. Um, but there's just so much of it around. It's um, It really needs a concerted effort like that. I, th I think say what you see again definitely um, document where it is and what it is it's a pocket of Himalayan balsam in a hedgerow three miles away from a water source that could possibly repopulate the entire catchment within five years so say what you see and do do record it it's becoming easier to record these things with mobile phones and various apps and stuff and you know I definitely think knowledge is power when it comes to fighting invasive non-natives especially I'm sure Richard and Beth there completely agree with you that we should be recording everything. Uh, absolutely, yeah, but uh, yes, it's a bit of a, a mountain to climb, I think, when it comes to inns. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, we, we, we're supposed to finish at nine. Now, time for one more quick one. Do you use drones to assist in monitoring river issues? At, at AC, there, there's literally just me working for Ronnie the Cumbria at the moment and, and our farm advisors. So, no, I don't have the capacity to use drones. But Harriet very excitingly mentioned that West Wales Rivers Trust are. So, over to you. Uh, yeah, we are, we're, it's the first time we're going to be using them. I know NRW have done some really cool projects using um, them to show before and after river restoration. Um, we're going to be using it to um, help map um land type and um the benefits of our nfm uh, interventions uh because we've got such a big area of land to work on sort of 1400 acres and a lot of it's um really difficult terrain to get to so we're going to be using it for for that method um so the difficulty with rivers is that uh, especially if they're if they're tree lined they're quite difficult to see from drones but i think it's something that's going to be increasingly important and you'll have a lovely time playing with it. I know, you? is that why? I wish I could fly it. That would be great. <laughs> OK, I think we're past five past nine now. I think we ought to call it a day. So thank you, the three of you, for your very interesting presentations. Thank you, the rest of you, for your questions. And um, we hope to be, well, we hope you've enjoyed this and you found it interesting. Um, and uh, we're hoping to put another talk like this on soon. So you'll be hearing from us. So thank, thank you. you all very much. And thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>